Hi, everyone. Thanks for putting up with all the video craziness while we were getting ready. I've uh, clearly been spending too much time working on uh, storage systems and not enough on getting this kind of stuff to work. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, what would look a lot better if my transparency had survived the, tra the transition to PDF here. Um, it's the intersection of three different uh, disciplines or areas of knowledge. Um, the red should have a label that says performance, and the blue is storage, and the yellow is cloud. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like add these one by one by one. So I'm going to start off by talking about some generic performance measurement uh, uh, thoughts. I'm going to add storage to that and talk specifically about storage performance measurement. And then finally, I'm going to add the extra dimension of cloud, which just makes everything a little bit messier. Now, some of the first section will probably be pretty familiar to a lot of people. Um, I think it bears um, a little bit of refresher because a lot of these issues in measurement become even more important um, and, and the problems become even more severe when you're trying to do this kind of thing in the cloud. The cloud creates uh, some, some very amusing challenges for performance measurement. So the first point that I want to make is that when you're, you're talking about performance, um, if you say I'm measuring performance, um, there's, there's all sorts of different things that you might actually mean. Um, and in approximate order of um, usefulness in predicting your actual behavior as the user or app is going to care about it, we can go from the very simplest measurement, uh, which is bandwidth, megabytes or gigabytes per second. Um, it's the easiest to measure generally. Um, it is also generally the least informative and the least likely to be a problem um, on a lot of systems. Um, certainly in the systems I'm familiar with, which are mostly distributed file systems, um, just about any of them can readily saturate um, the media that you, you have attached to your, uh, your machines in terms of gigabytes per second or megabytes per second. It's just not the hard problem. Things get a little bit more interesting when you start talking about throughput in terms of operations per second. Um, in the storage world, this is IOs per second. Um, then you will start to see a lot more differentiation between different solutions. Some of them will um, handle that much more smoothly than others. They will handle it much more consistently than others. Um, when you start getting a little bit uh, past that, you start looking at latency and how latency varies with offered load. Um, so what you often actually see is a graph of offered load versus actual throughput or offered load versus latency. Um, so you will, you will see um, in the case of throughput, you can actually add threads to generate more load and you'll see your throughput increase, but you might um, just as well or just as likely start seeing your latency also increase. So you're doing more operations per second, you're probably using more hardware to do it, your latency isn't getting any better. Um, and then the thing that really tends to go to hell when you start trying to scale up um, is the latency variation. So a lot of people uh, would quite reasonably recommend that the, the most important number that you should generally be looking at in terms of performance for any system or subsystem is not an average. Um, it's actually a 99th percentile. Um, so you want, you want to find out um, yeah, in how much time are 99% of these operations completing? And the remaining 1% are the ones that you're going to spend all of your effort um, debugging, basically. So that's where you start getting into the world of some of the things that Brendan Gregg has um, taught us about, the, the flame graphs, the heat maps. That's typically what you're going to, going to be using once you have identified that there is a performance problem. Um, I'm talking a little bit more about how you identify that that is the case. Um, when you've got something new, you've never seen it before, you're putting it through its paces, um, what do you look at? You look at um, the, the latency as it varies with load, um, and you look at the uh, 99th percentile latency. Um, one of the things that happens with latency in um, large distributed systems is that if you have a user request that is issuing a whole lot of backend requests, so for example, you have a user read in a distributed file system that's striped across a bunch of systems, um, or you've got a complex HTTP request, 
that's making its own backend request to a bunch of services that you have internally, um, you're often going to be uh, bound by waiting for the slowest. Um, and Jeff Dean, and I forget um, who the co-author was, um, wrote a paper about this. Um, and They came up with the term tail at scale. Um, and the idea is that those outliers uh, become more and more significant as the ratio of back-end requests to front-end requests increase. You look at something like what Google does, where a, a, a single search might actually be hitting hundreds of servers. Well, if it has to wait for the slowest, then something that was only happening 1% of the time um, on a single system is actually happening practically all the time on at least one of those 100 and is affecting your front-end latency. Um, so this actually um, is, is one of the reasons why in these highly distributed or cloud environments, it's even more important than usual to look at, at, at the distribution of latency, not just something simple like an average. Um, one of the other problems that people have in general with performance measurement is if you have a lot of streams or a lot of clients, a lot of threads, how do you aggregate them? And there's actually a whole lot of um, wrong ways to do it. Um, it's a little bit less clear what the right way is to do it. So I'm, I, I'm actually a firm believer that one of the best ways to learn uh, the right way to do something is to look at, look at it when it's done wrong and what happens. Um, so the, the most simplistic thing that people tend to do is they take all of these threads, fire them off, um, they, they go from the very start of when the first one begins to when the last one ends, and then they just say, well, that's the time it took, took to execute. And in some cases, they're correct. If you look at that tail at scale, that is in some sense what's really happening. But if you're looking at um, a bunch of independent activities, ones that don't have a relationship between them, ones that don't fan back into to the higher level result, um, that actually is very likely to give you the wrong answer because you're actually spending, in this case, you can see the second half of that time period, only two of the three streams are actually still active. One of them completed, the other two are taking longer. And you will see this all the time as, you, as you're trying to do IO in a distributed system. Um, so you actually very quickly end up getting a wrong answer that way. Um, you might have a system that is capable um, of doing X um, operations per second and you get a, a higher or lower number, usually lower in this case. Um, the second thing that you do, um, and this actually is something I see much more common, a lot of people know to avoid the first mistake. They, they know what's wrong with that one. Um, the second thing that people will do is they'll fire up a bunch, of, a bunch of streams, they'll measure them each separately and then add the results um, for each thread. So you see that your first thread completes in one third of the time, your second thread completes in two thirds of the time, and your third thread completes in the whole time. So you're adding um, one third plus one half um, plus one. And you might actually have a system that was really only capable of 100 megabytes per second, but because of this method methodological error, you're, you're adding up the numbers to get 183, which is also very wrong. The third and possibly most, most subtle and most serious kind of error, um, and I've actually written about this um, uh, in the notes, which I will be publishing these slides, I have some links to these sorts of things. Um, people try to solve the previous problems by doing something called stonewalling, which is, uh, the phrase comes from the idea that you start a race and the first one to hit the stone wall wins. Um, and the idea is that you start off N threads doing your, your IO or whatever operation you care about, and then when the first one completes, you stop all the others and see how much they got done and then you do all your math on that result. Now, there's two problems with this. One is it gives you the wrong number. Um, that's you know, a bit of a problem. When you see this kind of steady ramp down in performance as the data size increases, which you might see due to something like fragmentation, resource exhaustion, um, switching modes, um, exhausting cache, um, all these sorts of things, um, stopping the other threads when the first one completes is completely wrong um, because what you've done, you might have actually decided or, or tried to do an amount of I.O. that you know will exceed the amount of memory on your clients and servers. 
Well, if you stop prematurely, you actually didn't do that. You didn't actually do as much I.O. as you thought. And a lot of tools will sort of act like you had and give you numbers as though you had when, when you really didn't do the work that you thought you did. Um, so I'm actually really not very, uh, very much a fan of the stonewalling approach. I think you should actually do all of the I.O. that was requested. Um, and you, you should measure the, the, the results for the entire run but you don't just take an average across that entire time. You actually want to see the complete distribution of what happened during that run. So here's a picture that I, that I took from what is in some sense, um, it's, it, it's, it's fake data, it's, it's from a simulation, uh, but it's a simulation that was specifically um, written to um, reproduce behaviors that are fairly common in storage systems. Um, as you do I.O., you exhaust cache, you exhaust memory, you go to outer tracks, you do things like that. Um, and you're doing it across a bunch of nodes in a system. And you see a couple of behaviors that are actually really, really common um, if you look at the entire picture. Not just an average, not just one number or two, but you actually look at a picture of what happened to your performance. So here we have 10 threads. Um, they're each doing um, their I.O. You see some variation up and down, but more importantly, you see two um, sort of signature effects. The first is you see the staircase effect on the left, where you see um, a fairly constant performance and a drop, and fairly constant performance and a drop, and fairly constant performance and a drop. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this, this can be anything from moving from inner to outer tracks, cache exhaustion, memory exhaustion. Um, Systems that try to be self-tuning will often induce even more of these as they switch modes or algorithms internally. Um, so you see this kind of behavior a lot. Um, and then the other thing that you see is that most of the threads actually completed at about the halfway mark, and only two of them kept going. Um, and this straggler effect is really what confounds the simplistic performance measurements. Um, and it's extremely common in distributed <coughs> systems. In this case, um, I do know what, exactly what is happening, that this, in, in this particular simulation, those two threads ended up trying to access files that were on the same server. The other ones had a whole server to themselves, so they completed quickly. These ones are contending with each other. So they, they not only divide the capabilities of that server between them, they also contend and thrash a little bit. And if you were just to look at start and end times, whether those are start and end times for the entire set or start and end times for individual threads, you just wouldn't even see this. You just see that the whole thing seems to be you know, a little bit slower. Um, you know, a lot of people are subliminally aware of this. They, they do a performance test and they watch it run and they are aware of these fluctuations, but those don't make it into, into the numbers and graphs that are eventually produced. Um, you know, I think anybody doing any kind of performance test really does need to look at the entire shape of this. So how does this get more complicated specifically when you're testing storage? Um, well, storage um, has a bunch of variables that will affect performance. And how many people here have worked on a project and had to field questions about how well does it perform? How many have been able to give a simple answer? Yeah, um, it must have happened to me thousands of times. People say, well, how fast is it? Well, it kind of depends on your workload, doesn't it? Kind of depends, uh, depends on your configuration. Um, it depends on a lot of things. So these are just a few of the many variables that you're going to deal with. I mean, we're all probably pretty much aware of the difference between small requests and large requests. Um, that's something that impacts your performance, whether you're talking about storage or networking. Um, you know, read versus write, um, those are often in, in the storage world, um, you know, very, very different paths with very, very different performance characteristics. Um, you know, reading, reads can be cached, um, writes can be buffered or maybe, depending on, on what the user wanted, have to be synchronous. Um, or some part of it has to be synchronous while other parts can be asynchronous. Um, there's data versus metadata operations. 
Um, in any file system, you'll typically find that the simple read and write paths are um, the easiest to optimize, and thus they are the most optimized. Um, when you start doing any other kind of operations, um, those are less likely um, to have been heavily optimized, and sometimes they're just inherently harder. Um, one that we've hit in, in GlusterFS, which is the project that I work on now, um, we make extended, extended use of extended attributes. Um, we use extended attributes for a lot of things. Um, well, it turns out that the people who write local file systems, which are beneath us, typically hadn't expected that extended attributes would be used this much. Um, and so it became a bit of a performance bottleneck for us. Um, you know, they could sit there and handle our reads and writes all day, but they choked on our XAdder requests. Um, so all of these things play into a much more complex uh, picture, um, particularly for um, file system or file level operations than for block operations. Block operations tend to be extremely um, easy in a lot of ways. They don't overlap. Um, they don't have a lot of metadata associated with individual requests that needs to be updated. Um, so some of these factors apply only to, to file systems. Some apply also to blocks. So handling the simple case first, um, you know, what do you use for, for, for testing the performance of simple data operations? Well, the old school approach, and you know, I'm obviously a re, you know, pretty old guy in this, um, is IO zone. It's been around forever. There are better tools. I, I even mentioned one here. FIO, I would say, probably extends a little bit on what IOZone can do, um, but it's fundamentally similar. Um, IOZone is a tool that only does data operations. Um, it can do all sorts of different data operations. Um, it can do sequential, random, reverse, butterfly. Uh, it can do you know, synchronous, asynchronous. It can use AIO with different numbers of threads. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, you know, there's a ton of options to it, and one of the things that's a little bit off-putting to a lot of people is that everything is, is pretty much through options. So you, you have this sort of alphabet soup of flags that you pass to it. Um, there are some ways in which it's not very strong, um, and, and pretty much everybody I've encountered who uses it for any kind of testing on a large scale or distributed system um, tends to wrap a lot of scripts around it. Um, to handle some of these things. Um, cluster testing, um, there's limited support in, in, in IOZone for that. Um, it's pretty rudimentary. I think it could be a lot better. Um, one of the areas that FIO um, in particular does improve on IOZone um, is that it, it allows you to do random workloads with different distributions. Instead of just a flat distribution, write every block once, it can actually hit some blocks more often than others, um, a, a zip type distribution. Um, I think there's a lot more room to experiment with that. Um, for example, if you know anything about how local file systems work, um, they are typically uh, divided into zones, allocation groups, cylinder groups, whatever you want to call them. And then there's a distribution across those groups and a distribution within those groups. Um, and none of the tools that I know of really do a good way, do a good job of simulating the resulting um, aggregate access pattern. Um, you know, you, you, d you don't really see the, these blocks at the beginning of each band are hit a lot, these blocks in the rest of each band are hit less kind of access patterns. That's hard to do. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of like the workhorse of, of, of uh, you know, this, this area. Um, here's an example of some of the, some of the options that um, you'll see a lot of. Um, I, I mean, as, as you can see here, it says there's 67 more. Um, I'm just showing some of the ones that I, I think should almost always be, uh, be used. Uh, you pretty much always do want to include close in your calculations um, because that's you know, really when your I.O. Is, is, is sure to be done. Same, same thing with F-Sync. Um, you know, using the multiple threads um, and showing the child stats. It's not necessarily something you want to do all the time, but uh, it gives you some very useful information um, about um, the, the distribution of how much I.O. got done by each thread. So in this example, you know, this is a pretty simple test. I don't even remember where I ran it. Um, 
But you see that we, you know, this is, this is pretty typical output that you'd get. And it shows your, um, your total, but the two numbers in red actually will give you a very, very important hint that there's actually a large amount of variation between the fastest and the slowest. And that's something that you pretty much always want to investigate. Um, and the first thing you might want to do to investigate that is to run with the dash capital C option, which will give you this, this bottom chunk that shows you the numbers for each individual thread. So that tells you, do you have one straggler? Do you have two stragglers? Is it just like all over the map? Um, that can actually be a really important guide to what you look at next. Um, so, you know, data testing is, um, you know, it's the easy case. If you want to get into something more complicated where your workload involves more than just the data operations, just the reads and writes, you're creating a lot of files, you're deleting a lot of files, you're renaming, you're doing X adder operations, et cetera, all of a sudden you have a lot fewer options. Um, one of them is FileBench. Um, it's a really kind of strange, um, strange tool. Um, you define um, workloads in, in, in a very um, complicated workload model language, which is trying to simulate not only the actual I.O., but the internal synchronization of an application around I.O. So, for example, if you have a producer-consumer type of model, um, it, it includes the synchronization that you write this and then later you read that, or you read this and then you write that. Um, if you have to write 10 times before the next read, it'll handle that synchronization. It's complicated. Um, I'm not sure if it's always worth um, doing something that is that complicated and yet is still synthetic um, and is still kind of um, not the real workload. At that point, you might as well almost run the real application or at least a stub version of it. Um, another tool is dbench. It's not so much, this is from the, the Samba team, they use it a lot. Um, it's really almost more of a functional testing tool than a performance testing tool. Um, it, instead of being a true workload generator um, where there's sort of a random factor involved, um, it's really more of a record or trace and play it back later kind of tool. So you can use it if you have a really big trace um, to, to test how well that works. It doesn't have the sophistication that FileBench does as far as maintaining the correct ordering between operations. Um, so I, I think this is an area which is becoming increasingly important where metadata operations um, are increasingly something that people are concerned about. Certainly we on the Gluster team see that a lot, um, that, that a, lot of, a lot of users are entirely satisfied with the data performance and frankly, entirely dissatisfied with the meta metadata performance. Um, so, so there needs to be some better tooling in this area. So um, those tools, um, you know, the tools like IOZone and FIO work fine for both block um, and file level testing. Um, the, the, the other tools like FileBench and DBench are more oriented just towards files. What about objects? I mean, you know, objects are, are you know, the hot thing. Everybody wants object stores, not file systems. It makes me sad, but, you know, I kind of know that's the reality. Um, originally, when I was uh, uh, writing this slide, I was really tempted to put a, a, a picture of crickets or, or, or the vast void of space or something, because there's really darn little in terms of, of decent uh, object testing tools. Um, I know that when I was working on um, an object store a couple of years ago, I had to develop my own tools to do any kind of testing. Um, other people I know who, who've worked on object stores, in, including um, those who are doing it for Gluster, um, have had to develop their own tools. But nonetheless, I decided I'd, go, I, I'd, I'd do a little bit of searching, and I found the, this COS bench. Um, seems to do at least um, a baseline level of testing for a variety of different object stores, which means it can speak their respective APIs, it can handle their respective kinds of author authentication. Um, configuring it looks, uh, well, let's just say it's Java plus XML plus any files. It's not quite the way I would have done it. Um, on the plus side, it actually can do parallel and distributed testing. 
Um, but I think this is definitely an area where there's there's room for improvement. I mean, if 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 anybody came up with a really good tool for measuring performance for object stores, um, I think I think there's a lot of people who would be really really glad um, to use that and would be really grateful. Um, so lack of transparency bites us again. I guess you'll hear more about that in uh, Bruce's talk. Um, so now I'm gonna add the extra element of uh, cloud to this. A and hopefully I'll be able to show why it makes all of these fairly basic sort of principles of performance testing and storage performance testing um, even more important. The first, which is probably the most familiar to a lot of people, is in the cloud, the pu public cloud in particular, you have a really, really, really bad noisy neighbor problem. Um, some of the other talks um, that I've gone to already have touched on this. You know, it's fairly well known. Well known. So this is a graph uh, that um, I'm kind of violating my own rules because I'm just showing single numbers instead of whole graphs for these runs. But it's 100 runs that I did of the same instance type doing the same test. Um, I believe it was on Amazon. And you can see that we have a, a tremendous variation in the uh, performance between these runs and between these instances. Um, all the way from 6,000 IOPS um, to 16,000 IOPS. And no obvious correlation at all between what you'd get in two successive runs. I mean, it's just you know, total guesswork. You don't know where in that range you're gonna get. There's not even a, you know, a nice um, um, you know, thick band at one point that shows you that usually you'll get about this except for a few outliers. Um, it, it's almost a totally even distribution. Um, now, if you stop and think about that for a moment, if you need to create a system that can give a 99% guarantee of 100,000 IOPS, how many of these nodes are you gonna need? It's actually, you know, you can't even take the averages and just say, well, usually I get about 12,000, so I'm going to need eight. No, it doesn't actually work that way. Um, you actually need to do some combinatorics to figure it out. Um, I actually have a slide uh, at the end that, that shows some of the results from, from something like that. So that's um, pretty bad. Um, what this graph is showing is a little bit more digestible uh, version of the same information for Amazon, uh, plus similar information for Rackspace, and somebody you never heard of, Host Virtual. I, I know they're tiny. Um, I, they, they were the place that I picked for my own personal cloud server that I leave running as an SSL proxy and web server and so forth. Um, mainly because it was uh, well located for the places I needed to reach from it. Um, turns out it's uh, pretty much just down the street from here. So while I'm here, my, my latency through that SSL proxy is better than it's ever been. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, and also, um, not, uh, uh, you know, not, not too sadly, um, Rackspace just announced a new class of uh, performance in oriented instances, and the only place they're available happens to be IAD. So they're probably like a couple hundred feet from where that machine is. Um, so that's pretty handy too. Um, and what you can see, you know, the, the important thing here, um, what this is showing is, you know, sort of a cumulative distribution function of how many of 100 samples are at or below a particular performance level. And so if you look at the blue line, for example, you can see that Amazon does occasionally get up to 16,000 IOPS for this instance type, but only at the very, very, very top of that, that curve. You know, much more often it's lower than that and it's this really um, you know, bit long slope. You know, if you're skateboarding down it, you pick up a lot of speed. 50% um, you know, of the time you're, you're, you're down at like 11,000 or below. Sometimes you're all the way down at 6,000. Um, you see the rack space curve is a completely different shape. And this is gonna have a completely different impact on your planning and provisioning. Um, that you, yeah, you have a few outliers at the top and the bottom, uh, but mostly you've got a pretty, pretty small slope from 4,000 to 6,000. Um, Host Virtual has a really strange one. Um, and I just ran it there because you know, I happen to have a server handy and I you know, didn't have to spend more money to spin one up. Um, you see that there's kind of a messy thing going on until you get up to around 12,000, but then 75% of the samples are in a very narrow range above that. 
Actually, it turns out that when you're doing something um, to model your performance um, and reach an SLA, this is actually not a bad curve. Um, this is actually easy to plan for. Um, if you have a reasonably large population of servers, you do have a few that are slow, but you also have a whole lot that are within a, clustered within a very tight range. Um, so the other thing that's different uh, between providers is the performance ratios. Um, so what this graph is showing is the ratio between the disk I.O. performance and the network performance of different instance types at Amazon and Rackspace. Um, and you can see that the Amazon ones have a certain ratio of, you know, um, you know, a thousand IOPS or less. They're, Amazon, in my experience, doesn't do too well on I.O. They do pretty well for network. Rackspace tends to be a bit the opposite. Um, so, you know, you see them clustered at the top left. And that's pretty nice clustering. I mean, it's, it's a pretty even set of ratios. Um, yeah, rack space is a little bit more spread out at the top right, but still, you know, you can sort of deal with this. You can say, well, you know, network is going to be my bottleneck because of this ratio, or disk is going to be my bottleneck because of this ratio, and it's going to hold true across a variety of instance types. Both of them have outliers, which are unfortunately hidden behind a yellow blob um, down in the yellow section. Um, the smallest instance type uh, for each provider um, is sort of very much separated from the others. Um, in case anyone's curious, um, just yesterday I did actually have a chance to run some tests on the new um, Rackspace um, instances. I tested a, a 1 gig and a 15 gig. Um, and if you're curious, um, let's see, the 1 gig would be about there. Um, the 15 gig would be pretty well over in the next room and about twice as high. Uh, so <laughs> they really threw off the curve with that. Um, those are actually really interesting and, and, and pretty worth checking out. Um, I actually did sit in my room earlier today and try and redraw this graph. Um, but they were so far out from the others that the graph provided no, no information content <laughs> anymore. Um, so I'm trying to focus in on just the, just the older instances here. Um, some other problems that you often get with um, testing storage performance in the cloud is um, you do get these clunkers. And you can sort of see that if you go back to this graph, um, in, especially in the rack space and host virtual cases, you see that some instances are just way worse than the others. I mean, I mean very obviously, this instance just kind of sucks. Um, so, I mean, this is also a fairly well-known problem. I've seen talks and slides and, and, and blog posts from Netflix where they say, well, you know, we kind of test this when it starts up, and if it turns out to be a bad one, we kill it and start a new one. Which, you know, if you think about it, that's a really horrible way to have to do your, uh, your provisioning, is to, well, try it and see what happens. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a reality of working in a public cloud. Um, You've got um, very significant network inconsistencies. Your, um, your instances, when they're communicating, uh, might show very, very different behavior depending on whether they're the same host or the same switch or, or even further apart. Um, and you don't actually get a lot of visibility into that. So, so you, you, you don't sort of know that they're the same switch or not. You just sort of see that the... the uh, the performance characteristics indicate that they must not be. Um, there's actually a whole field of uh, um, public cloud fingerprinting to figure out the network topology based on these kind of performance metrics and so forth. Um, when I first started doing this, I actually ran not only into performance glitches, um, but um, functional glitches that I, I tried setting up an instance of ClusterFS on uh, some servers at Rackspace and things were just really, really funky. And eventually it turned out that two of my instances were on the same host. Um, I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm pretty sure. And those two could not communicate, which is kind of backwards of what you'd expect. You'd think the ones that were on the same host would, would be the most likely to be able to maintain contact with each other, but it wasn't. So there was some kind of misconfiguration going on within, it, within Rackspace's infrastructure. Um, so I had to start a new instance uh, to be able to run my tests. 
The last thing um, that I'll mention here in working in a public cloud is cheating. Um, it's kind of sad, um, but public cloud providers often do pretty much cheat on I.O. performance in particular. Um, I know that um, some of them, you, you can pretty well tell if you run a large amount of I.O. through them that they are clearly not honoring some of the flags that you're setting. Um, they will configure systems so that um, you know, they have RAID cards that are supposed to have a battery back cache, um, but there's you know, really nothing there. Um, so they will lose data if, if, if the host for those instances will, will fail. And I actually brought this up with some people I know who are inside working at, at public cloud providers. Um, you know, none of them would admit to this, of course. Um, but none of them would look me into the eye and deny it either. So, <laughs> you know, take what you will from that. Um, so, you know, you, you sort of do have to keep that in mind as you do performance tests. And if the performance tests just seem kind of unrealistic, that it's like, do they really put all these things on 256 gig servers so everything's getting buffered into memory? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, th there's just, Games being played there. So, um, in conclusion, um, you know we've talked a little bit about general performance um, and how important it is to to look at not only the averages but the percentiles and and really the whole picture of what happens during a performance test. Um, and that's what makes um, the massive vari variability that you see. Um, across instances and across providers so much more important and so much harder to deal with. Um, so if you want to figure out how many instances of what type you are going to need to um, spin up to reach a certain performance level, you really do need to test um, many providers, many, many types of instances, many individual instances to make sure you didn't just get a clunker. And you have to repeat your runs a bunch of times. This, this is always good practice. Um, but it becomes even more critical when you're testing in a public cloud. Um, because you already have this huge testing matrix that you have to run through of the different types and, 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 and providers, it's actually really important to reduce the other variables. You don't want to be testing 10 workloads on five providers and six instance types per provider. Um, so you really want to try and characterize your target workloads pretty carefully before you start doing these tests. Um, and another thing that supports that running a lot of tests is you want to automate um, everything, which again, generally good practice, even more important when you're testing in a public cloud. Um, the other thing is that if, if you're looking to assure a particular performance level, you have to think of it not in, a, in the sense of just adding up averages or adding up anything really. You have to think of it in terms of, well, if I got eight good ones and two bad ones or nine good ones and one bad one, you have to work through the permutations um, and, and, and have a more complicated, more sophisticated model of what the probability is that you will reach your performance target. It's not just a, a, a performance rate, it's a probability of performance. Um, and then what you can do is you can use simulation or modeling to determine how many extra instances you will need to spin up to get from a, well, maybe we'll make this number to we have a 99% probability of reaching this number, which is usually what your users and your apps are gonna want. Um, and give you just a very quick example. Um, I do include the URL right on the slide here of when, when I wrote about this on my blog, one of my blogs. Um, if you want to have that 99% probability of 100,000 IOPS, using the same data that I, that I generated to show a lot of these graphs, you might reach that target with seven instances on Amazon. That looks really good. I don't remember what instance type it was. It's kind of beside the point. But because of that variation, because of that, that nasty slope down from 16,000 to 6,000 uh, IOPS per machine, you might need 13 to get that 99% guarantee. Similarly, with rack space, you might get there with 14, but to get to 99%, you need to double that. You need 2x over provisioning. Um, and you know, the real key here is that a provider which would not have seemed to be the ideal in the optimistic case, 
actually takes over and becomes the, uh, the, the best, better choice in the more realistic case. And that's what you really need to focus on is you need enough information from doing the tests um, in the right ways and looking at the, at the data in the right way to do this modeling and come up with the right number for how, mu how much you really need to provision. And that's it. Hey, Bruce. Did, <coughs> sorry. Did you look at all at error rates uh, between the providers and how those might impact upon how many machines you need in order to make, maintain a certain level of service given recovery times if, say, one service provider has disks failing 50% more often? In these particular uh, experiments, no, I did not. But that is an excellent idea that, that you should include the possibility of instance performance equals zero um, a certain fraction of the time in your calculations. Well, thank you again.